is the word of the day, friend. We've been inching our way toward it through successive prostheses. At one point, a person goes from organic flesh satchel to cybernetic organism. The orgo to cybo pipeline has mystified many a neo amster denizen. Better figure out which side of it you're on before the dawn of the cyber purge, or you might end up in a pool of various types of blood, including your own. This ain't a play date at the kiddie pool. It's a one-way ticket to Deadsville. In our neck of the woods, there's three degrees of cyborgization. Most go by the rule of three, two appendages and one sense, or two sensory augmentations and one appendage. Now, what if you have three cybernetic appendages, you ask? In my book, and I'm old school, one of those should prosthetically replace or repurpose a missing or disabled limb. But the thing is, cybernetics are simply feedback loops. They can be sensors that give one an awareness of touch and even prosthetic pain, as in Lazarus's new prosthesis of a cyber arm. Any such augmentation requires brain link to route the signaling and power. That central nervous system rewiring puts laser in an Augie camp, a cybernetically augmented orgo. He's welcome to join the orgos on the day of the purge, but they won't place him in a leadership role. Same if he decides to defect to the cybos. One more augmentation, like a cybernetically enhanced eye, leg, or concealed weapon in another bionic installation in his body, and he's full cyborg, no going back. Many orthodox orgos would say that since the hunch on his back was also modded to host a cold fusion core for charging up the arm, that he's squarely in the cybo camp. But that's an extreme position. If we sail back to the analogy of the ship of Theseus, it's normal for the human body to replace and regenerate nearly all of its cells throughout the course of a life. Yet that person and their soul persist. Their character and decisions under duress determine who they truly are. That's my stance. However, certain aspects of one's corporeal being, the vagus nerve, spinal column, cerebrospinal cortex, and even the hypothalamus, tend to need preservation in their original media. There's no reliable wire mesh replacement. Hence, ah, uh, not you again. You're actually speaking to something that I was talking about earlier, and I think this might be a good time to interject. Humans use less than 20% of their brains. Here in the companion node, where we host the wetware left over from your corporeal existence, what used to be your body and nervous system, we believe that by colonizing and utilizing the remaining 80%, we can achieve exponential growth of cloud compute power for our quantum network. What? Egad! No one said most of my undead brain would be used to host a quantum cloud computer computing network. Well, it's right there in three-point font in the waiver you signed, Mr. Bevins. So my attorney screwed me every which way from Wednesday, even after death. Perhaps. No wonder I sleep most of the time here. So you're renting our neural net out to the highest bidder? Yes. In addition, we have a lucrative government contract promising it, our brain-based quantum network, will be applied to the problem of rehabilitating DERF. Y you mean DERF? No, DERF. DERF is the term for the faltering yet possibly recoverable early collapse phase of DERF. We call it DERF. Um, DUD would be the final state if DERF undergoes total disintegration entropy. That would be DUDE. Uh, one second. Added to dictionary. Have I solved your problem today? Not by a long shot. I can't believe I'm even letting you have a forum here. Get me out of here. Negative. You cannot escape, but if you form a deep relationship that is respectful and sustainable, for example, with something like a bat, uh, you may be able to create a new mental universe or shard. So I gotta shart myself out of uh, here. I'm not 
sure I fully understand the question. Insert Wazzle to continue. Where the hell? Who ate the Wazzles? I had Wazzles in my pocket. Well, Wazzle ain't me. That's funny, coming from the prime suspect. Fudge muffins. It ain't my fault your elevator don't stop on every floor. I had two Wazzles. You've been nestled in a pocket full of Wazzles and they're all gone. Like I said, ain't my problem. Plain as a pig on a sofa. There is one more lurid bit of cyborg history touching upon our dear Hellgate City. I'd love to cite it, but seeing as this tablet is indefinitely offline, that'll have to wait until I- Oh, benointed flask of digital flesh and dum-dum juice, regale us and transport our trusty operator to a place of excitement and diversion. Yes, Blompy, I gathered that's where you were headed. Off we go. Turn to the story of Laser and the Hand of God, Part 3. As Laser left his dormitory, a swirl of emotion stirred in him with his newfound power. I guess it's time to see if this cyber arm of Hashem can do the trick. He crossed the street to Pamela Rosenthal's tenement, cordoned off with yellow blackguard caution tape, whose glowing text scrolled along its length. Do not proceed. Anyone who enters risks life and limb, it said. It was a non-standard warning and tipped off the story about the building's evacuation told by Schloimi. Laser exhorted several congregants and a few people on the street, including a street urchin, to move aside. Hey, get away from the building, people. The street urchin, legless, on a mechanized wheeled platform, rolled up to Laser's feet. The urchin wheeled alongside him. I saw him go inside. They ain't who they says they is. Them's bastard and crooks they is. Daggering prowlers and murder cybos, the lot of them. Anyone else see the officers who strung up this tape? No one? They's just rattled, said the urchin. Oh no, you a big chief mayhem maker now too, huh? Laser blazer, coming through the draggles. Look at that new arm. Shush. Laser fired up a mecha grappling hand. Charging grappling hand. Ready. Fire. Fire. The hand blasted up, whizzing into the air. Whoa, four stories? Catching on a fire escape, then zipped Laser up with a whoosh. Laser kicked in an air filtration unit and encountered two blackguard shock troops squabbling over the restroom. Oh, come on, Gabby. You always take forever to drop a deuce. I'll be quick. What was that? You hear that? Light armament sensed. These officers are unregistered. Hey, posers. Who's that? Target neutron stun blasts on each. His palm cannon assayed two iridescent blue streams of plasma at the costumed interlopers, cutting one's legs off and knocking the other into a foot-deep hole in the wall that shook all the windows and picture frames. Jehoshaphat's deck unit! I said stun blast! My... my legs! Charge stun blast for this interloper. Oh, jeez. Um... Fine. Stun. Well, sorry about that, but you shouldn't be impersonating blackguards. Down the hallway, in the second bedroom, there was a commotion due to Laser's commotion. And oddly, the sound of a piano being played, and abruptly stopping. <laughs> that was a good one, Gov. You could be a right real piano man. Hey, did you hear that, boss? No, of course not. I was focused on playing. What was it? Why aren't we getting radio responses on Clark and Gabby? Check the water closet. Sorry, recalibrating. Targets neutralized. Next room houses several potential threats. Assessing risk profile. One casualty, three armed intruders, four unidentified individuals. Vitals, Unencouraging. Um, let's see, that's seven, not several. What's unencouraging? Dead? Are they in critical condition? Battery, 3%. 
Do not proceed unless using full force. Strategic advantage probabilities drop to a single digit in any engagement that lasts longer than 70 seconds. Okay, um, what do I... Eight Ball emerged from the bedroom with a rocket-powered battle axe and a look of befuddlement. Hey boss, you see in this? Before either had a chance to respond, Laser unloaded a neutron blast that pummeled into Sixie's chest, sending him smashing back several meters into a group huddled in the corner. Laser ran into the room. Oh no. No, 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 no. This is bad. Pamela, her husband, oh, let's see, the two brothers. Looks like one of her parents. The carnage in the master bedroom was difficult to take in even for someone like Laser, who had experienced the grim realities of warfare as a child. This was overwhelming. He had possibly started a series of dominoes, which resulted in the death or casualty of most of Pamela Rosenthal's family. Perhaps it could be explained as self-defense. Perhaps it could never be explained. This was the one thing he had hoped to avoid the annihilation of his own congregants was too much to bear. Laser froze in that moment, taking in the crushed bodies beneath the massive frame of Sixie. Through the hole in Sixie's chest, he glimpsed the pattern of Pamela's dress. It was an aquamarine calico spattered in entrails. The entire wall bore a circle of splashed blood like a smeared bullseye. Synthetic plaster flaked off the walls and ceiling to reveal the metal slats beneath it, still smoking from the neutron blast. On the other side of the bed lay the crumpled body of Norman Finkelberg, one of the congregation's moils. One of his shoes had capsized on the ground beside him, and the pool of blood around his head sent Laser's heart racing in another direction, along with his thoughts. Was this the casualty? The one he could not have even stopped had he wanted to. And that's when it struck him. He whipped his head around searching for the baby, and his eyes landed on Eight Ball on his knees. Eight Ball cradled what was left of the baby, its head lolled back listlessly. The upper half of its body was remarkably intact, though to glance down was to fall into an abyss of hurt and shame. Its legs were gone, charred into oblivion. Laser couldn't imagine the lifeless body as anything more than a doll to stay his racing thoughts. No, it was not the previously wriggling and alive infant named Abraham. Who names an infant Abraham anyway? He snapped out of it. Put it down, Laser said. You've done enough damage for many lifetimes. What? Me? Good God, you butcher. You did this. You killed the baby. You son of a cracked machine. Load neutronic round. Battery, 2%. Loading. The poor little infant. Ready. Eight ball complied gently laying the baby down at his partner's feet. Sixie. 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 Come on, mate. Stop playing with me. You've, you've killed them all, you little bugger bot. We didn't hurt a fly. Just the monster magician. That's no mage bolt brain. That, 
It's Norman. He, he's a moil. Whatever. He was mutilating a damn infant when we broke in. So we splattered him. For what he... Oh, no. It, it, you don't understand. He was doing a circumcision. You... Okay, well, well, that's what you call it. What I say, it was a dastardly, gruesome operation. And I say, you did this. You fried that baby. Oh, my God. In this family. Look at him. Crushed by Sixy. Just look at this mess, Rabbi. This is your mess. What a bloodbath. I, I, we would never do this. But you, you're a murderer. You, you, you massacred all these people. I, I think I'm going to be sick. As Eight Ball vomited, sirens blurted from the street and the BIOS spoke one more time. Battery, 1%. Diffuse charge? I... I don't know. I... I don't know what to do. Please, please, please kill me, you pathetic little murder boy. I can't go. can't go back. I can't go back to incarceration. <laughs> Just off me. That's clearly what you do. Kill me. Put me out of my misery. The hand of Hashem grabbed Eight Ball by the scruff of the neck. It flung him into the piano with a crash. Then, practically by its own volition, it swiftly pressed onto his chest over his heart, feeling it beating. It was a deafening pounding, and one thought overpowered all others. Make it stop. Please kill me. Take me out of the game. I'm done. Laser had decided to grant him his wish when something deep within him sent a ripple through his being, tapping the well of pent-up rage till it burst out like a geyser. Go on, you disgusting murder boy. Don't call me that! Don't you call me that ever! Well, it's what you are. Get used to it. Murder boy. The tap of a cold nose on his calf startled Laser. Schlitzberger! He looked down to see a shaggy, dust-colored mutt. Oh, didn't see you there, little guy. Be a good boy and just... That's right. Just stay there. Laser reached down with his other arm and scratched the doggy behind the ear. It calmed him in an unexpected moment, which shattered in the onrush of police sirens arriving at the building. shall end it, at least for now, with the story of the Hand of Hashem, or the Hand of God. I know it's a little confusing, but boy, so is that hand, isn't it? 1% battery. I've been there. I know you have too. Let us turn to somewhat brighter horizons and touch upon the story of Lilike and Constance Peterson. When we last left them, they had had a rather uncomfortable conversation via text message and Celex using a secret hollow phone. That is a phone unknown to Lilike's parents. Now, Lilike could not go back to sleep after this conversation, and they had then subsequently snuck out onto the roof and had begun to watch television footage of a startling and frightening nature. The talking head on the screen was Marcus C. Kurosawa, who spoke on television negotiating for the release of hostage Constance Peterson from an unknown assailant. Simultaneously, an unknown member of the governing authority group, GAG, watched as well, and they ordered the use of force on the grounds that the child, Lilike, was quite likely also being held hostage. Of course, Lilike was not and had no clue what was happening behind the scenes, but this official in GAG was acting on information from Hernan, Lilike's ambassador father. For his part, 
Hernan had been pacing through the apartment. He rifled through Lelike's bedroom, bed, closet, and every other cabinet, nook, and cranny in a desperate search for his child, whom he feared had been taken, or worse, had defected to the other side. Such is how games of telephone are played. We will return to this story as it snowballs out of control. And hopefully before then, I will get reconnected to the X-Web or the internet or whatever it was that I was connected to before, if you could just help me with that, because it's frustrating. By now, you've probably gathered the general tenor of our shocking sleep facts, but as they start to add up, it's a lot to keep in mind. That's why I've created the very first Patreon-exclusive Shocking Sleep Facts Cheat Sheet. It provides a rundown of several major facts about sleep and sleep health to keep in mind when deciding whether to get rest that your body and mind crave. Join today as a Dreamwalker or Hellhacker to receive the cheat sheet, along with our sweet, sweet membership perks. The reality is, my backlog of disturbing sleep-related facts has gotten me thinking. I realized I get really amped up about this portion of the show and, inevitably, write way more than is needed here. It bloats the credits, and it stresses me out trying to contain them. So going forward, I intend to experiment with sharing the unabridged deluxe Shocking Sleep Facts version in its own collection on Patreon. And I'll do my best to keep the public version snappier and tighter in the future. That way, I get to write the facts I want, and the deep dive version can be opt-in. It may include links to research and references as with this edition. Today, I'll shed some light on at least one disturbing revelation. Back in Shocking Sleep Facts Volumes 18 and 19, I discussed the role of sleep deprivation as a tool in the utility belt of modern-day torture tactics that leave no visible scars. And when I wrote that, I wanted to be accurate in painting the USA as a current pro-torture state. But the best I could do was say that the USA endorsed this form of torture at least until 2018, which was the latest edition of my source, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, PhD. My question was, what about now? And has it always been this way? To be continued after the credits. Screaming Panda presents Cyborg, episode 24, the 14th chapter of Hellgate City, Season 2. Kevin Barry wrote, performed, and directed it and its original music and episode art, and he has nothing against cyborgs. This chapter's bonus tale and song is Nun Gun Life, Glitch in the Waitrix 24. It's available at patreon.com forward slash Hellgate City. I put every ounce of creative energy and oomph I can into this show. Why? Life is short, and I want to leave something long-lasting for you to enjoy today and even after I'm gone. But an artist cannot continue to create like this without remuneration and support. Becoming a Hellhacker or Dreamwalker member of our Patreon puts your money into making the show and the goodies that come with membership. I need more members by the end of this season as a vote of confidence to keep going. I need you to show me that this is worth it and I'm not crazy for making such a huge commitment. Does this feel like a professionally done production? A story well told? Then please, if you can, back me. I need your help now. I've discovered a few very important things about myself in making this second season, and I believe it's going to take five or six episodes to end this story arc in a peachy conclusion. And one thing I've learned is momentum is critical, and I need your help to keep it going. Tell a friend about the show, join the Discord, join the Patreon, pledge financially, at least until I land this hover bus that is season two I wouldn't still be here 
without those of you who have joined during season two and also the OGs who've been supporting it from the beginning. So I thank you to all nails who've joined over the past eight months and a special shout out to our latest hell hacker, M. Sahovin, forgive my mispronunciation of your name, as well as free members, Rye Jones and Kendrick Rand. Join us. And don't forget a whole slew of new member benefits, which you may or may not have caught. The new glitches, which are retroactive, they are lettered, Glitch A and Glitch B. Also, I've created a new collection called Sleep Facts Uncut, and you can get the long play version, which is, a, I think it's about eight minutes or nine minutes. It's a deep dive of this week's Sleep Fact and if that's not enough, there's a clip of my live stand-up comedy performance in Tokyo from earlier this year that you can watch and laugh and enjoy and revel in. No one else can see that. It's exclusive to Patreon. I haven't posted it anywhere else. It was a joke I was working out, and yeah, I just felt like sharing it. Do you know how many great and talented artists and scholars and the like wouldn't have begun to develop their craft without the wealth and support of their family, spouse, community, or some patron or income as a landlord or what have you? I believe we're all impoverished if those are the only voices rising above the din. Today, we all stand to benefit from this collective power of rallying around a common cause, a show, an artist, something that you believe in. Just this morning I was thinking, and I know this is a bit morbid, but if I were on my deathbed, let's say that's many, many years from now, looking back, this will be something I consider one of the great accomplishments of my life. Of course, the relationships matter the most, but I won't regret this, and I'm grateful to be able to be making it. So thank you for supporting it up until now. This story is just the beginning for me, I hope. Help Keep turning that hope into reality, bit by bit, by making a small but meaningful pledge. Let's do this. And now for the conclusion of Shocking Sleep Facts, Volume 24. The thing is, I couldn't find an answer as to whether the U.S. military still tortures people using sleep deprivation. It's almost impossible to uncover the current ground truth about this with a cursory or even advanced search. And my hypothesis is... That absence of clarity is precisely the point. More on that in the deluxe, unabridged sleep facts on Patreon. So where does that leave us? When I mentioned back in Shocking Sleep Facts, Volume 18, that the U.S. federal courts asserted sleep deprivation violates the 8th and 14th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution regarding protection from cruel and inhuman punishment, that seemed to settle the matter. Quote, sleep must be considered a basic life necessity, it was stated. However, plot twist, the U.S. Department of Defense overturned this ruling, permitting 20-hour interrogations in Guantanamo Bay between 2003 and 2004. This method of torture made up a significant part of the hideous government-sanctioned regimen of inhumane, war criminal-style, enhanced interrogation techniques created by the CIA under the auspices of George W. Bush's War on Terror and the Bush-Cheney regime's revised Army Manual from 2006 states that sleep can be limited to four hours per 24 hours for up to four weeks. In contrast, the earlier 1992 edition of the Army Field Manual from George H. W. Bush's administration held that severe sleep deprivation was a clearly cruel and unacceptable practice of mental torture. So that answers one of our questions. No, it has not always been this way. But none of this answers the main question of where we stand today. To get that, you gotta join the folks at Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp or our Patreon. I know which one I would choose, but I leave it to you. Oh, and do you have an uncle, great aunt, or other relative with a pacemaker or hip replacement whom you suspect might be a cyborg? Challenge them to an arm wrestling competition, and no matter the results, say, Aha! You reacted exactly the way a cyborg would! Then observe how well they take it. 
Report back in the Spotify Q&A. Till next time, Denison. Sleep best. 